Reggae Jean Page, uh, you play Chicken George in the new miniseries Roots, uh, which was previously made, of course, in 1977. Uh, and, that, and in that miniseries, there are roles played by Ben Vereen. Uh, had you seen that original miniseries? Um, yeah, a few times. Um, I saw it as a kid. I kind of had um, a well-meaning adult handed it to me at some point. I must have been about 10 and kind of went, you know, watch this. It's good for you. These are your greens. Eat them and you'll grow up big and strong. You know what I mean? Um, you understand the world around you a little better. And then I ran into it again in high school. It kind of got shown at some point. Um, and then I watched it a third time once I got the role. Uh, and you pick up very different things from the series each time you encounter, you know, from being a, a child to being an adult. But by the time I got on set, I was very, very well versed um, in the original roots. Yeah, what was it like, uh, you know, you mentioned you, you, you watched it again after you got the role. What was it like playing the role uh, after having it so fresh in mind? Did, did you feel any pressure or did, you know, did it influence your performance in any way? Yeah, I'm sure it did in some way. I mean, the performance wasn't so fresh in mind so much as the story. The reason I watched it again before starting was because uh, this is a story that's already owned by our audience. That's kind of the biggest pressure walking in. It literally is already owned and loved by millions of people before you step on set. And so there's a responsibility to having to bring something worthwhile to that, bring something new. Because not only the cast, but everyone in our audience is going to be asking, why this story? Why again? And until you've answered those questions, you have nothing to bring. Um, but having said that, I think that there's inversely a really great fuel and fire to having to answer those questions because then once you do step on set you absolutely have the very highest ambitions because you have to bring you have to improve upon something that is already so loved that is already so good which means you are literally taking the moonshot you know everything has to be good enough to improve upon greatness you know what was the what was the casting process like uh, for you to end up landing this role and, and what appealed to you about chicken george um, <laughs> I'm never quite sure how much I want to confess uh, to being close to George because George is flawed. Um, but I think that that's what um, appeals to me about him more than anything else. That my biggest want for what I could bring to this project was to humanize it, to bring three dimensions to people that have been historically and all too often misrepresented as two dimensional ciphers you know, the noble suffering slave, um, or just generally ignored in history. People of color have a hard enough time getting our stories on screen in the modern day, never mind period history. You know, we've got a hundred million Jane Austens, but turn the camera 90 degrees to the left and we're still there. You just don't like looking at it quite so much. Um, and so the thing that appealed to me about George was the fact that he was an absolutely fascinating man who grows and changes and just goes through everything that you can relate to today in human beings. I wanted to bring as much of that to him as I possibly could. The fact that he was so complex, that he goes through such an incredible journey from being a petulant adolescent, like all of us always are, to being a teenager who thinks the world revolves around him, to growing up and learning that actually your parents have things to say to you, that they're not just making up to try and make you miserable. There is a lot of knowledge and wisdom that comes before you and taking that journey um, I found hugely appealing. Uh, Chicken George is, uh, in addition to being, you know, such a complex character, he's also a very fast talking, larger than life yeah. uh, uh, personality. Uh, well, how did you work uh, to build up that sense of, of showmanship in your performance? Oh, I mean, that's all me. <laughs> um, no, I, it's, it's a lot of work. I'm actually quite uh, intensely private and introverted. So kind of um, getting to that very open outward place, uh, I think comes just from getting to know your character because you start asking why he does these things. Why is he so extroverted? Why is he so charming? Um, why does he make such an effort to entertain people? And I think someone said this when they were watching the show on Twitter, and I was so happy that this got out, um, that a lot of that is very much the survival mechanism. Um, I don't know if uh, you've ever heard Maya Angelou's poem, The Mask, where she talks about the difference between the smile and the mask uh, that oppressed people have historically worn as a survival mechanism, where your reaction to everything is you throw on this smile uh, because that's non-threatening, you know? It's a way of charming people with more power than you um, and therefore fitting into their society. And once I plugged into that, once you plug into why someone is the way they are, why they express themselves the way they do in this incredibly charming and appealing way, um, then it becomes a little easier because you're using it as a tool towards something. 
you know, everything is um, towards a goal. And George has a very specific goal. He is a hugely, hugely ambitious young man who wants to be defined on his own merits in a world that tells him he has no merits from birth. You have no birthright to having any merit. And George says, hell no, yes, I do. I've got all kinds of merits and I'm going to show you every single one of them, you know? And, uh, and George's story is also unique in, in the miniseries in that I think it spans the longest time period of, of any of the major characters. Uh, you know, we start with him as as the brash adolescent, as you mentioned. And then by, you know, by the time we leave him, he's he's an older man. He has children and grandchildren. Uh, yeah. He, You've been separated from many of you know which for for decades uh, how challenging was it to embody that whole psychological and emotional transition over over such a long time period um hugely is the short answer it was very very challenging i learned huge amounts about myself playing george um and about who i might become as i take that kind of journey personally as well it's very strange, actually. People were saying that it must be strange to kind of see your face older. Because, um, you know, I spend like two and a half hours every morning in makeup for older George. Um, and that's not the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing is once you start sitting into uh, the version of yourself that has so much more experience, that has scars from their mistakes and has learned from them. Um, and just kind of, I remember on set, you know, I kind of sit there looking at my, my children and my grandchildren, thinking these young fools don't know a thing. Um, and then at the end of the day, you have the makeup ripped off. And you get this fresh faced, stupid young face back that doesn't know anything. And it's really frustrating to lose all of that um, experience that you built up, you know? Um, and so it was challenging, but it was also um, very educational, informative. I learned a huge amount about myself, about, um, about my own parents and kind of their perspective on me and kind of how your elders look at you. And it was, it was enriching more than anything else, but yes, very challenging. Um, and just a ride to kind of take on all that experience and grow from it. Uh, at one point, uh, George is, is sold away overseas and, and that's when this this uh, gap of 20 years in his life uh, comes that where he's separated from his family. Uh, since we don't see much of that experience uh, during that, that long period of time on screen, uh, did you do any work to fill in those blanks for yourself to sort of come to an understanding of, of, of him and, and how he got to, to where he ends up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where I'm, it's very much in the way that I was trained that you're, I was, I was taught that you um, you imaginatively create all of that experience off screen. It's very much what you do in like Greek tragedy where nothing ever happens on stage. You, you just talk about the war over there and how people died. And then you have a very intimate conversation with your mother generally. Um, and it's similar to that where I write myself little essays, like little creative stories about all the stuff that's happened to me between scenes. And then hopefully you carry that on. And so you have physical scars and the prosthetics and I would make sure that I knew how each one of those scars came about, what happened, what the story of it is, where the limp comes from, where all these little bits of damage that make a human being. Um, I'd make sure that I would know what that is. And then hopefully that carries through quite naturally into my body and how I carry myself and how you look at people, whether there's more suspicion or more hurt or more confidence as a result of those very specific things. And they can only be specific if you write them down and imagine them and then run with it, you know? I have a whole second script that I've written myself for all the stuff that you don't see on screen, <laughs> you know? Oh, that, yeah, they should they should uh, option that as a spinoff at History next year. <laughs> yeah, call <Medical> George. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, what's, it, another thing that's interesting about uh, George is that, you know, he's the he's the grandson of, of Kunta Kinte, but, but, you know, he is sort of disconnected enough from that history, uh, uh, that that he, he he's a bit disconnected from his family roots and his, yeah. his culture. Uh, and it made, that made me think of, of sort of the way a modern audience might actually watch this, who may not themselves appreciate their connection to this history. Do you think his journey and the audience's is kind of similar? I certainly hope so. Um, I think that part of um, George's function in the story is that you are meant to see yourself in him. He is, um, in many ways, the fruition of the story of Roots, which is about crafting this new American identity, a family that was once African, is ripped out of Africa, brought to America, and is given a new identity and eventually creates a new identity for themselves as African Americans or as Americans. America in general is forming its identity in this story. Um, and George is the end result of that. He is, 
you or I sitting in the world going, hang on, why are these systems built in a way that somehow doesn't take me into account? Um, who am I? Am I African American? Am I American? How much do my roots weigh on me? How much um, am I simply what I've created for myself? And all of those stories are at the center of what George is discovering. George starts out, um, like I said, in a very teenage place where everything is about you and you have no history and your parents don't know anything. And then obviously you make mistakes through that. Um, and then you learn that every the road you are standing on, you know, you may be writing this incredible um, story, but the desk and the pen were built by your mother and your grandmother. Um, and suddenly you realize the value and the weight of where you come from and how that has built who you are and who you want to be and who you want to build for yourself. Um, and so that's all terribly pretentious, but I think hopefully that's everything that George embodies, that, sto that, that story of growth from trying to be defined by yourself, but still acknowledging where you came from and how that is intrinsic to who you are. Now, uh, you know, speaking of, of identity, uh, you know, especially for George, that's particularly complicated because his, his father is, is his master Tom Lee, played by Jonathan Rhys Myers. And of course, he was conceived because Tom Lee raped his mother, Kizzy. Uh, and that relationship between, between George and, and Tom is so complex and, and, and strange and, and dark. Uh, how did it feel to play out those scenes with, with uh, Jonathan Rhys Myers? <laughs> How does it feel in three words? I'll say it in three emojis or less. Um, geez, uh, like you said, it was hugely complex. It was, it's not an easy place to start your life from. Um, and like I said, I mostly accessed it through thinking about forming a sense of identity. You know, George is a child who is definitely not born of love. He's born of the most horrific and brutal of circumstances. Um, but all you do as a kid is you look for love. You know, you look for role models, you look for places of acceptance, you look for um, adults and people like you to say, this is what you can become, this is what you can grow to be. And George naturally does that, even in these incredibly uh, difficult circumstances. And so he looks up to Tom and that's tragic and painful, but also in a strange warped way kind of heartwarming because you just see a kid looking for a dad, you know, um, as so many um, young men of color do as well. You know, I mean, it, the story of the absent father is not one that is unfortunately unfamiliar to us. Um, and so it was all of the complexity that is in that. George wants to be loved, George wants to love Tom. And Tom doesn't really help with that in any way, shape or form. Um, and that constant push and pull between finding acceptance, um, between bribing and bargaining for acceptance and just having it ripped away time and time again um, I think hopefully is one of the things that's most touching about George's story um, and the relationship between him and Tom. And, and there's that moment uh, when that switch seems to finally flip in George when when uh, uh, Tom sells him overseas uh, away from yeah, his family. <laughs> that, that's such a, an intense emotional scene for George. Uh, what, what was it like shooting that one? Uh, horrific, <laughs> in a word. Um, that was a really, really tricky day. Um, and I think we just filmed, uh, we kind of did it almost chronologically. We just filmed the scene where George wins his freedom. And, you know, it feels like the whole world opens up and the sun shines a little stronger and you just got this incredible elation uh, going through your system. And then you kind of go down the other side um, of the set and you go through every single thing that you've worked for your entire life just falling in on itself. Um, and there are very few times on this set that I kind of lost myself a bit, but that scene was one of them. Um, doing that take after take, losing your family, your sense of identity, the last shreds of hope in that relationship. Uh, it felt like the whole universe just imploded in on itself. There was a black hole in my chest and it all just went, you know? Um, it's every possible painful emotion you can imagine. Betrayal, uh, anger, grief, um, shame, shame at failing your own family. And I think those are the kind of things that you start getting to once you start playing a father, once you start playing a man, not a boy anymore, someone with responsibility who through some fault of his own and mostly through things he cannot control, he has to leave his whole family and he lets them down. He no longer can protect them or provide for them. And that is, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> the way we broke for lunch that day uh, is there was, I think, maybe the fifth or sixth take of being dragged away. Um, something flipped in my head and I lost myself for a minute and I just couldn't breathe. There was nothing, but I, I kind of collapsed. Um, and I felt the camera follow me down as a good camera does. I'm like, oh, this isn't in the choreography, but something interesting is happening. And then they just watched me weep for about 20 seconds. And then I felt the set kind of respectfully melt away as they went, should we take lunch? Yeah, let's, let's take lunch while the actor has his breakdown. Um, and Thomas Carter was very good. He kind of came over and put his hand on my shoulder for a bit and we, worked through that for a while but it's it's tricky it's really tricky having your heart broken 10 or 20 times a day on a set like this you know and, uh, another uh, 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 strong aspect of this character is is the women around him uh, you know his mother mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kizzy uh, and 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 his wife uh, played by Erica Tazel uh, what was it like working with Anika Noni Rose and Erica Tazel as as this character who doesn't always appreciate how good they are and, and what he's necessarily got. Um, it's out of this world. And I mean, I always appreciated quite how good Anika Nani Rose and Erica Tazel were. It's a, an absolute privilege to kind of share a set with people who are just that good at what they do, who are that honest, who are that open. Um, it makes your job incredibly easy in one way, because all you have to do is, it's a bit like sitting in class next to the kid who's really good at the test. You just watch, copy, and learn. Um, and then in other ways, it's really difficult just because the standards that you have to match are so high. They always bring something so truthful, so honest, so personal to the set that you, you, know, you walk onto the scene and you see in their eyes that there's something going on, something very personal, something very delicate and intimate. And you have to match that space. There is no option um, of kind of phoning it in that day. There kind of never is. It's all the stakes are too high and the story is too important and the standard of people you're working with is just too high for you not to raise your game every single day. Um, so it was a privilege. Um, and I was incredibly lucky to be in that environment because it does a lot of the work for you. It lifts your performances. Um, just to, to be able to stand on your own two feet in such uh, a place of quality, you know? Uh, you yourself, uh, you're from the UK by way of Zimbabwe, uh, and now you're telling this story of, uh, you know, African-American history. Uh, how does, did your own background kind of, you know, change your perspective or, or give you kind of a different outlook on, on this particular story of history? Um, quite possibly. I mean, different from what would be the question. I've been fascinated uh, that since I got to America, um, how people have been very, very adamant. This is such an American story. How do you tell such an American story? Um, which I can understand because it is a very huge part of American history. And as I said, the formation of an American identity on, on both sides of America, across everyone. Um, but when I first watched it as a kid, I was in Zimbabwe when I first saw it. Uh, and I saw it naturally as an African story because I was in Africa. I saw it as an Afrocentric story. It's an African family who were taken to America and figure out how to be American. Um, in the simplest terms, I mean, in incredibly difficult circumstances, but that was the heart of it for me. And so I was like, oh, oh, you, you see this as an American story, that's fascinating. Um, and so I think that the sense of what that identity is and where it comes from changes hugely depending on your perspective. Um, and I think one of the most important things we've done with this version of Roots is we switch the perspective. And we spend so much more time in Africa establishing Kunta Kinte and his family's identity before it's defined by this horrific thing that happens, before it is defined by having a new identity put upon him, before we have the whole your name is Toby thing. Before that, we established Kunta Kinte, which I don't think we spent as, we were as brave to do um, in the original. Um, I don't think we were as brave enough to spend as long in Africa respecting that African identity. And the more you have that in place before it's ripped away, the more painful that is. Um, and so I think that it's about perspective. It's about how much weight you give to each separate identity. And I don't know how much of that opinion is formed by having grown up in Zimbabwe away from the UK or um, the States, or how much of that is just where our conversation is 40 years later. You know, I think that this show is as different um, to the original as the world is different to where it was 40 years ago. We've talked about um, racial politics, about racial identity so much, a lot because of the first show. Um, and we've learned so much more about our history and we tell our history differently. We have more empathy. Um, 
for people who are not uh, the founding fathers. We have a lot more empathy for the people who were under their heel. Um, and so I think everyone's perspective has changed. And I think the way we tell stories is more international now. And I'm just kind of a, a symptom of that. Now, uh, the miniseries aired in the U.S. Uh, a couple of weeks ago from uh, May 30th to June 2nd. Uh, what kinds of reactions have you been, been getting to it since, since it aired? Uh, it's been overwhelming. It's been um, hugely, hugely overwhelming. Uh, it was terrifying to take on, and none of us quite knew what it would be until it reaches our audience, you know, the people that you're actually representing and doing this for. Um, and the reaction has been huge. People have, by and large, been very, very touched by it. Um, people are sending me all kinds of stories uh, to my Twitter account, my Facebook account, kind of saying how they've been inspired by it, how they recognize themselves in it. Um, and generally, people have been saying thank you. Thank you for doing such a good, uh, to the whole Roots team, for doing such a good job with this, for, for respecting it, for bringing something new to a history that we need. Um, and so that's hugely, hugely gratifying and encouraging that it's rare in our business um, to be able to put out entertainment that is also nourishing, that is also valuable and precious to people in a very, very rich way. And so that's, I have no words to describe that. It's, it's so cool. Well, I would like to congratulate you again on, on the miniseries and, and its success and this role, uh, which, uh, which uh, hopefully will lead to uh, more and more great things to come for you. Uh, thank you so much for, for talking to me today. No, you're very welcome. The pleasure was all mine.